Welcome to Potentials, everybody. This is Lija, and Ed Kaberski is back with me to do the Airships episode number two. Yay! Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you again for having me back, Lija. Um, thank you for the, coming back. Yes, it's, this it's is fun. Early, early flight um, is yes. kind of how it was. And, you know, uh, now that we've done the interview with um, Chris Beskar, the CEO of Stavati Aerospace, you can kind of understand why I went back to the early flight but I really went back there because of you um because I know that you love airships yes <laughs> so yeah so um this is this is the second one and I think that there's four there's two more after this one and it kind of leads right into um when the Wright brothers started to fly so we're going to kind of stop there and we're yeah. going to go you know from where we where we've gone to about where the Wright brothers are and then we'll stop there mm -hmm. and then of course if anybody really wants to know about flight I absolutely um you need to go to potentials and check out the Chris Brascard interview because um he is the genius that is uh basically our whole future of flight is um Stavati you know, Aerospace exactly yes. Stavati Aerospace yeah Chris Brascard so yeah so yeah, let's get to it. We have some uh, uh, pictures. We have up. some very interesting pictures today, and I am really looking forward to sharing them with you because uh, we have. I don't. Can you see this Chronicle of yeah. Aviation? Yes. Yeah. We have this yeah. book that your was it your father's book? Yes, it was my father's book. Yeah, he, my father was in the Air Force, so um, I built model planes when I was little. Like I built all of the jets and all that kind of stuff back in the day. So. Yeah, this is a really thick book, too. It's probably like four inches thick. And do you know and what year this was done? What year this copyright? I will done? find out. But if I were to guess, I would say around 25 years ago or something like that. Okay. Because it was my father's book and he, uh, he's he been gone for quite a long time. So it could have even been in the 90s, maybe, when it yeah. was done. And, Looks like it could have been, yeah. And cool. it has almost literally every aircraft design that was ever built in wow. it which makes it other than probably stavati actually um i never looked for stavati i'm sure it's not in there but we could add a section right <laughs> yeah <laughs> so this okay. is the first picture from 1861 yes. to 1869 at the very top corner it says yeah and um what we're going to focus on i i can't see uh, very well um but it, it's right. Englishmen soar to a dizzy new heights. Ah, so that's right. the one you're going to want to focus on. Right over here. Yes. Okay. Well, my, my picture's in the way. I'll move it. Okay. Two intrepid British astronauts today ascended higher above the earth than anyone before them. Frank Coxwell, son of a naval officer and distinguished meteorologist, James Gla Glacier. Today, they lifted off from Wolverhampton at 1.03 p.m. in a balloon carrying many scientific instruments. Passing through a layer of cloud, they emerged into bright sunshine and by 1.22 p.m. had reached 10,560 feet. By 2100 feet, 21,000 feet, the air was becoming thin and cold, but still they rose. At 26,000 feet, the valve line became tangled in the, uh, let's see, ropes. Wow, right there is a picture, I guess. Um Coxwell has fainted. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's what it says under the picture. The pair mm -hmm. knew they would have to free it or they would not be able to control their rapid ascent by releasing gas. Coxwell climbed high into the rigging to free the valve line. Soon wow. they were apparently at 29,000 feet where the air is very thin and the temperature below freezing. Glacier found that he could no longer see to read his instruments, and then he lost the use of his arms. Finally, he blacked out completely. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Coxwell managed to free the valve line, only to find his hands too frozen to hold it. In the end, he tugged it with his teeth and began re releasing gas. From a reported 30,000 feet, the unconscious men descended to, at last to warm oxygen-rich air below. They have now recovered. Oh my goodness. I know, right? When I read this, I was like, yeah, like that is with his teeth. He used his teeth because his arm. Yes. His... He saved his, his teeth saved his life. And, and you know, um, my best friend's a helicopter pilot. And uh, when they even go to 20,000 feet in a helicopter, um, they're using oxygen. So for these guys to go above that to 29,000 
and yeah, passed out. They're lucky to be alive, literally, yes. actually. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so, so the next one is um, 1870. British, yeah, British okay. Army discovers balloon power. So it's on the next page or the like the next one. Part, it's, oh, right here? Um, sure. That's yep. where it begins. And then I guess it finishes on the next page, right? So, okay. Uh, the, no, I think that's it, just it. Oh, that's, that's it? it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a period. Okay. British Army discovers balloon power. Um, this is August 23rd, 1878 in London. The British Ar Army has its own balloon, which flew for the first time today at Woolwich, Southeast London. It costs 71 pounds to build out of the 150 pound allocated by the War Office, the first British government military aviation budget. Aptly named Pioneer, the balloon consists of cambric envelope coated with varnish of um, 10,000 cubic feet gas capacity in charge of the balloon development. And first British air commander is Captain James Lethbridge Brook Templer of the second Middlesex militia, um, an experienced aeronaut. He owes the balloon crusader. He owns the balloon crusader, which he will lend to the war office to begin the training program. He is paid 10 shillings, 50 pence a day when employed on balloon work in 1883. Wow, amazing. What a, what a job, right? You think about it, that's like the first job description of someone like that ever, you know? Wow. And, and the British Army too, so that's really cool, right? Yeah, amazing. 1878. 1878. Yep. So and this one... the next one is a uh, French captain uh, maneuver their French captains maneuver their airships. Wow. Look at all this. All these other pictures on here are amazing. I know we can go back to some of them um, later oh, cool. as well, too, because I've just chosen just the, you know, the yeah, ones that no, that's, caught that's my fun. interest, essentially. Yeah. Fran France, August 9th, 1884. This afternoon, two French army captains made the first ever fully controlled circular flight. Charles Renard, director of the French military balloon establishment at Chalet Moudon, and Arthur Krebs ascended in, in their airship La France at 4.15 p.m. today and started their 9-hour, nine 9HP, nine their 9HP Graham electric horse motor. Power. Yeah. yeah, horsepower. Yeah. When the ship had risen to 165 feet, the aeronauts first steered the airship in an easterly direction, then over Villa Coulble, they executed a neat turn and headed back to the Chalet Modon. After 25 minutes, flying at a speed of 12 to 14 miles per hour, La France was floating 100, 825 feet above its point of departure. Renard and Krebs have proved that airships can be steered like sea vessels and be made to take off and land where desired. But their engine with heavy batteries weighing 704 pounds is not wow. really practical for aircraft. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Wow. And electric too. But what's really important about this is it was the first ever fully controlled flight of an mm. airship. Um, yeah. So they're gaining control and, and being able to do things that they need to be able to do. Yeah. Right. Really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, then this is the other one that I was I was noticing, right? Um, Ayer's machine of 1885 depends on pedal power and compressed air. Wow. Compressed that air. Is, yes. That's interesting, wow. isn't it? What a contraption. That's what they <laughs> called them back then, you know, contraptions. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't look very safe to me, actually. No. Just saying. It looks like a playground that you, you know, like yeah. those playgrounds we used to have as monkey kids. bars. The monkey, the monkey bars, bars right? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if you saw that flying by you? You'd be wow. like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting. Like, you know, he probably it's, did it. It's really it says, interesting. Eccentricity <laughs> and fantasy mingle in early unsuccessful attempts to conquer skies. Eccentricity is right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yep. funny. 
Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And, and that is the one that you were supposed to go to. So you, is if there's more reading there, you can. I uh, back there, there was reading. I didn't see anything. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. There was, I, uh, I mean, it was really cut off if, if there is anything to read. Um, okay. I, I th I've got something written down here about that. It says okay. in 1890, patent offices around the world are being, um, uh, Deluged with ideas by inventors who believe they have discovered the secret of powered, and then I can't see anything else. Yeah, yeah, because I um, I think that was all that I was going to say about it. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's just such a contraption, like you said. <laughs> yes. Very cool. Okay, Very cool. and then there's this one is French captains maneuver their airship. Is this what you're referring uh, to? French, French aeroplane hops. So I can't see anything on the page. It just says a somewhat fanciful contemporary engraving shows the eel in flight. And then I can't read the top of this because um, on today, October... Oh, here it is. Today's hop. My thing was in the way your screen. My screen sharing thing was in the way. Oh, OK. Today's hop took place in the grounds of the Chateau Darmain Villiers <laughs> near Paris. <laughs> Uh, Adder started to roll along the prepared 650 foot runway at 4.04 p.m. And two minutes later, he boosted the propeller's speed and felt himself take off with a jolt. The only witnesses, Adder's foreman, Aloy Valier and Espinosa, said that the machine was about eight inches clear of the ground for a distance of 165 feet. Well, that counts. That's levitating, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Named Eol after the Greek god of the winds, Adder's aircraft has a monoplane wing of 46-foot span and a primitive tractor propeller made of bamboo and driven by a, well, that's cut off. Something bamboo. has to sit immediately. Yes. And driven by a something which got cut off, unfortunately, has to sit immediately behind the steam boiler and cannot see where he is going. Wow. <laughs> the only significant factor regarding today's hop is that the machine, which Adder calls an avion, ran across level ground, and so it did indeed rise under its own power, albeit briefly. Yep. Previous such hops have been assisted by chutes or sloping ground. This is therefore an important first, but Adder himself, who now hopes to gain research funding from the French War Ministry admits that his interesting creation has insufficient stability and that there exists the, necess the necessity for further study. <laughs> yeah. October 14, yep. 1897. Oh, okay. And and that's interesting because um, the Wright Brothers flight was really the first controlled flight. So so that's something that, that yeah. people have to understand, right? And that's why, um, you know, like you said, it was levitation, although very short and not Only very much, very. but it was really cool looking though, right? Like it looked mm -hmm. very um, like the thirties. I can't remember what they call that style in the thirties, but I, the trains and all the art deco, art deco. Oh, art deco. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It kind of looked like that sort of a mm -hmm. little bit. It yeah, had a it style. Pretty, yeah. It had a personal style. Yeah. It's very eccentric. Um, okay. So what, and, what are we reading and, here? And this one's uh, Maxim's huge biplane hurdles briefly aloft. Oh, Okay. Where is does that start where a Frenchman writes history of flying? Is that where that oh. starts? Yes, okay, because here yeah. it is, I believe. Uh, oh, wait, no, here it is Kent, England, July 34th, 1894. Yeah. Sir Hiram Maxim's giant biplane made a truly awesome sight today. I have to move that out of the way as it took to the air. The ma machine with a wingspan of 104 feet and weighing a massive 8,000 pounds thundered down its broad gauge launching track at 42 miles per hour with its two 180 horsepower steam engines supplying great power to vast propellers and using just 600 feet of the 1800 feet of rail available it lunged upward maxime wow. and his th three man crew held on tight but then things went wrong <laughs> There were wooden guardrails feet above the track to resist the flight, but the more powerful machine suddenly broke through them and floated free like a giant kite. Oh, wow. Then just as suddenly the length of the of the of my 
of something, fouled a propeller to avert disaster. Uh, Maxim shut down the in the something, and the machine descended. Wow, that that's pretty interesting. Again, so we're getting closer and closer to 1903. You know when mm. the Wright brothers flew. So um, pretty interesting again. But the two. 180 horsepower steam engines like yeah. that's you know the first first flight is with steam engines mostly and electric mm. you know the yes. nine horsepower electric that is really interesting right um something that most people probably didn't know and i didn't even really know actually no um, a lot of people don't know it and there, even cars back then there were a lot of steam run steam engine run cars and things like that and, Elec and there electric, were electric cars back then too yeah there were probably more electric cars probably. originally and and that than there was a gasoline ones actually yeah absolutely. i've got another i got another book just like this but it's all about cars mm. and it has all the old stuff in it too and talks about it so but maybe down the road we can look at some of that stuff too cool yeah yeah. So the uh, next one is just, um, I've got it written down 1891 to 1899, and it might be that column down the side. I, I can't remember. Is it um, this this one right here? This whole yeah, column? Yeah, I, th I, th I think so. But I, I think I would have just picked out, you know, the, mo the thing that looked most interesting. I don't know if I would have read it all. Oh, actually, I wrote down in Paris on October 7th, 1898. Oh, yeah. Um, Here it is. Yeah, Alberto yeah. Santos Dumont makes a flight in his airship. Number one, it ends in a crash. <laughs> September 22nd, <laughs> 1900. So, yeah. 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 So I just, yeah, I think I wanted to add that because it was uh, an airship, right? Um, and unfortunately, again, you know, they had control issues back then. They were still learning about everything. And that's, you know, probably what mm -hmm. happened with it. it right. Helps, huh? When do you think airships became more popular where they were starting to use them more probably after this right that would have been um, after 1900 actually it's very interesting that you say that because the third uh third one that we're going to do like the one after this on mm -hmm. um early flight um has the first zeppelin in it oh okay so and that was like the 1920s 30s almost sort of thing if That's I remember I correctly, yeah, yeah. I, I did. I did these quite a long time ago. I did these last year of these mm -hmm. all these shows, so I don't really remember all the what I wrote down. Um, the next one is uh, Swedish balloonists disappear over Arctic. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Andre and Frankel examine their balloon forced down by a coating of ice. Okay, Spitsbergen, July 11, 1897. Three astronauts have vanished after taking off from Spitsbergen on an attempt to make the first flight over the North Pole. Wow. wow. Nothing That's has true. been heard of expedition leader Salomon August Andre or his two companions, Nils Strindberg and Knut or Nut Frankel, since they lift lifted off from the north shore of Danes Island shortly after 1.30 p.m. Observers at the launch site say three trail ropes designed to provide ballast and keep the balloon at low altitude fell off, allowing the balloon to fly much higher than planned. Wow. Andre was a meticulous organizer, and he had gone to great lengths to build safety measures into his 170,000 cubic foot capacity balloon, the Omen. Wow. Wow, he named it the Omen. That's not a good omen. <laughs> um, no doubt. Don't name it the Omen. Uh, the upper hemisphere of the balloon was made of three layers of double Chinese silk and the lower of a single Chinese silk skin. Special safety features were incorporated to stop the blocking of the valves by snow and the icing up of the balloon. It is now feared that Andre and his fellow explorers were not will not be able to survive the bitter conditions of the Arctic. Unless they go into the inner earth where they will be okay. Oh, <laughs> so they there can you find go. That pathway, they're, they're Never fine. thought about that one. I just want everybody to be fine, you know, <laughs> in the most weird, strange way possible. I always find the silver lining. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have never even thought about that. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> okay. So the next one. Yeah, the next one I've got, uh, Dayton, Ohio, September 6, 1900. Okay, Wilbur Wright. We all know who that is. 
leaves Dayton, Ohio for the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk. I'm sure it says Kitty Hawk, yes. North Carolina, where he and Orville plan to test their full-size glider. Staff at the U.S. Weather Bureau recommended the site for its strong, steady winds. Yep. So I, I found this one just because this um, shows you that they went to Kitty Hawk before with the glider um, and to test things. And so it wasn't the first time when they when they actually flew at Kitty Hawk. Right. Yeah. 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 Pretty neat. Oh. Um, and th so that's like about three years uh, before the actual first flight, right? Yeah. And and yeah, this one I just got um balloon rises above the battlefield and it's just such a cool picture and it just shows you um that you know that they did use them in the military essentially. Yeah. At, at some point, right? Yeah, yeah, that does that makes sense. I think it's uh British Army clashes with Boer rebels in South Africa with an observation balloon. So this is actually in South Africa during the Boer, okay. Boer War. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really interesting. No, nineteen hundred. Really, it says it says nineteen hundred up here. So. Yeah, just a really beautiful picture. Happened. Yeah, and then yeah, and then the last one is American scientists test model airplane. Oh. And cool. you might know this American scientist, perhaps. Okay. Uh, Washington D.C., May sixth, eighteen ninety six. A self taught astronomer has today cap cap catapulted a model aircraft about. 3,300 feet along the Potomac River at Quantico and proved once and for all the possibility of powered heavier than air flight. Samuel Pierpoint Langley, sec secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, has been building and testing his aerodromes, interesting, for five years only now. With aerodrome number five, has he met any success with any success? The steel model, which has a 14 foot wingspan and weighs 26 pounds, was catapulted from the roof of Langley's houseboat at a height of 16 feet at 3.05 p.m. today. A, a one horsepower steam engine drove two propellers. Inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, was watching mm -hmm. as the machine flew for about 90 seconds at a height of 100 feet before it ran out of steam and landed on the water. The aerodrome later made another flight. It looks good, but it is only a model and has no means of control. November 28th, 1896. Could this be the forerunner of the drone, perhaps? Um. Well... It seems almost think, like a drone. Drone. But I th it says drone. I think I... I think they used to call them uh, aero, like aerodrone was a name, uh, I think that came from France, perhaps. Yeah. And it was kind of a name like um, for the aircraft, I think before they settled on, you know, aircraft or whatever, there was quite a few different names that they used, I believe. I might, yeah. I might be wrong about that. But yeah, that's very lightweight, 26 uh, and pounds. It's, and it's neat that it was Alexander Graham Bell that was watching, right? Mm. Um, goes to show you that uh you know how they were interested um it was such a magic time can you imagine being back there i know you would love to be back yeah. there during this time right um i might have been back trips. there and i just don't remember <laughs> oh i'm probably i'm pretty sure you probably were <laughs> yeah i wish i could and remember you're but... probably flying in a zeppelin no doubt <laughs> <laughs> maybe i was that first lady that was on the is it took oh. the flight around the world? <laughs> that would have been yes. cool. Yeah, yeah. You shared that with me once, and it was actually a BBC um uh yeah. movie that had documentary. Been done. Yeah. Yeah. About yeah. uh, like you said, the first reporter. She was a reporter lady, wasn't she? Yeah, she that, was um, a journalist that they allowed to fly. On. They wanted her. They actually not allowed, but they invited her by yeah. special invitation to be on this flight that was one of the first to go around the world the entire uh, 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 the entire world and it had beautiful cabins it was gorgeous inside you know yeah. uh sleeping quarters that were just like a hotel you know and uh um and there, dining there was room even that was a like chef. a hotel and a chef too remember uh, the yes. chef and yes yeah. a very <clears throat> like a french chef you know like they were eating very well it was like a like a five star restaurant um and hotel on you know in in the air <laughs> yeah so, amazing right yeah um amazing. and the round the round the world thing uh i've 
mentioned this to Chris Baskar. I don't know if I did it on camera. I don't remember, but no. remember we talked about um, wanting to take the first hover car flight around the world. Oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk <laughs> yeah. about the, about the era, about the documentary, but we did say we wanted to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> uh, and then what we would do is we would um, do these uh, podcasts from different locations and, and it would, <laughs> In my mind, it would be just to prove that um, free energy can take you around the world, essentially, because yeah. it'll cost nothing to fly because of the fact that there's free energy on board. And um, yeah, so it's just a, a really, really cool concept that hopefully we get to do at some point. We happen to oh. know a guy, so it's, that's kind of yeah. good. Yeah. Yes. And So is this and the that, last one? Yeah, that's 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 it okay. for today. But yeah, like awesome. I said, there's uh, there's two more, um, and uh, the one's got the Zeppelin in it that I, I know that you really like, and I, I th think it's from 1931, if if my memory serves me correctly. And um, so cool. Really excited to bring that to you uh, soon. Actually, um, we're going to tape the last Wingmakers uh, probably tomorrow or sometime this week and then we we've got some other cool stuff coming as well yes there's so much stuff that we have planned so everybody just stay tuned and and it'll be coming i know i took a little break there for a few weeks um just a kind of wellness break you know uh was working a full-time job and it was just taking a lot out of me and uh yeah so it's nice to have a little uh yeah a little wellness break and yeah. uh and so now we're, you know, we're back. So thank yeah, you absolutely. everyone for yeah. watching and we appreciate it. Love, love doing this, love uh, sharing this kind of stuff with you. And we look forward to doing a lot more of it in the future. Thanks again, Ed, for coming back and we will see you thank all next you. time. Ciao for now.